Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 167, Brian Windhorst. Uh, Tommy, we've talked to Wendy now for a few months trying to get him on. Uh, blessed it's hard, harder to, to get, get than an Wendy. appearance from him. <laughs> well, you know, he the guy can cook. The guy can cook. He's, he's busy. He's, he's a busy guy. You know, he's on TV shows. He's writing. He's got his own podcast, The Hoop Collective. Uh, which is always a lot of fun. Um, he talks a lot in this interview about uh, free agency next year, winners and losers. Um, he's just so plugged in and just has such a great feel. Talks about his experience throughout his career, uh, his his uh, connection with LeBron, uh, and how he got started in the NBA. And of course, uh, his first take appearance last July after the Royce O'Neal trade and the memes that followed. Uh, Brian's always a lot of fun. One of my favorite guys to work with. Um, Tommy, are, have you have you watched any summer league yet? Uh, I just watched Chet and the Thunder. I watched the first game, and I was saying, I think I tweeted this afterwards. The Thunder need to be on national TV. They haven't released the schedule yet. They certainly haven't released the national TV schedule. Yet. The Thunder need to be on national TV way more this season because this team is going to be super fun to watch. Um, what about you? Uh, I watched a little bit of the Lakers last night. Um, Max Christie uh, and Hood Shafino uh, both both played well. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it was coming off the band and golf trip, and then you know, July Fourth stuff. Um, but I will be tuned in. Vegas Summer League starts tomorrow, and I will be tuned in. I'm calling the semifinal games on the 16th and the championship game on the 17th, so I will be out there with the 115 degree heat. Um, here, I did not know this, Tommy, and maybe I'm just an ignorant fool, but on DraftKings, you can bet for the Summer League MVP, which is incredible. Of course. It's just incredible. <laughs> like, first of all, you have to be a basketball sicko. You really do. Sicko. To really be tuned in sicko. to Summer League. And I, I actually think there's a, like, I've seen stuff on Summer League where, like, ah, uh, you know, it's like, it does, it's not real. It's not the real NBA. You know, you can't glean too much from summer league. Um, but sometimes you can, like sometimes you like, I wanted to see Jalen Williams. I, I did watch some of the highlights from the other night, you know, Jalen Williams with the ball in his hands more. I, I thought that was, he's a guy we talk about the thunder being on national television. Just give me more Jalen Williams. Give me more of him. Yeah. Um, and, and, and Julian uh, Champagny, who right now, for summer league MVP is plus 2,500 for summer league MVP. Um, the field is plus 950. If you want to bet on that. And then we've got scoot Henderson in there at plus 1100 Kenneth Lofton jr. At plus 3000 Jaden Hardy at plus 2,500. I like the Lofton jr. One. He's I just, know. he's a really fun dude to watch. He's going to put up numbers. Yeah. You know, we, we, I, I would assume when Benyama plays a game or two, at, at, you know, max. So we probably won't get a full 10 days of him. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, there's a lot you can, you can get out of it both from, you know, the, the perspective of being a fan and a, a spectator, uh, but also a, as a player, um, you know, I, I think the opportunity to, for a guy like, like Jaden Hardy to have the ball in his hands more, you know, he showed some really good play towards the end of the season when he when he was in the rotation um after the trade and you know i i think he's a really talented guy and he's going to have the opportunity J jared dudley gave a great response to a reporter's question about what he's looking for out of Jaden hardy and and uh i i just i think for any young guy it's it's you got to look at it as like an opportunity to improve right yeah um and sometimes uh, we, we've seen it. A good summer league can lead to uh, a spot in the rotation or a you know a, a big season. It, it, in the same way that U.S. not maybe not in the exact same way, but the same way that playing for USA basketball sort of gives you a leg up on the upcoming season. Um, it's it's game experience, and I think that stuff is is so important. Um, I know we touched on rookie of the year a little bit last week, um, but I wanted to go back because I, I felt very dismissive of you you did when you said chet Hem holmgren and i i wasn't that wasn't a knock on chet that was not a knock on chet you just seem so sure of it 
And I want you to, I want to give you the opportunity now. He's at plus 450 to get rookie of the year. Uh, right now, those are the third best odds after women, Yama and Scoot Henderson. I want to give you the opportunity now to explain yourself of why you think Chet Holmgren will be rookie of the year this year. I'm going to be clear. I don't think he's going to be rookie of the year this year. I think Victor is going to be rookie of the year. I think that, that there's there's zero chance that I'm that I would make that bet that that Chet Holmgren is going to beat Victor for good year. I think Chet is going to be the runner up to rookie of the year. And I think that he's going to put himself in a very strong position that if it was basically any other season and he was competing against anybody else, that he would win this award. And my, the basic reason I think people saw this in the first two games, and some of this was just like seeing him work out last summer and hearing guys work out with him since he's gotten back from the injury is he just like competes like crazy on both ends. And I think defensively, I think he has five blocks so far in the first two games. I think he's going to be a force immediately. And I think it's, it's also just going to be really interesting to see how he fits with Shea. But that team, he has, he has better pieces around him than Victor does. So they're obviously going to win more games, and that's not going to matter that much, um, you know, probably in terms of this particular award. But he's going to be put in a better position to succeed immediately. And so um, I basically think I basically think he's going to have a really good year. I just, I just don't, I'm not betting, I'm not betting against Victor because Victor's going to, the reason I'm betting against Victor is because Victor's going to play, knock on wood. You know, I don't think he, there's nothing about his personality from the time we spent with him right like that that makes me think that he's playing 30 games and they're shutting him down. And so if this guy plays 65, 70 games, he's, you know, we don't know, but it's, 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 it's hard to bet against him. Yeah. I, I, the one, uh, the one player, that could be directly affected in all of this, um, or and likely will be. Let's just say because Dame has officially requested the trade. Portland's talking like Scoot Henderson. Depending on the package coming back, right, and and which players come back. Like if it is Tyler Hero that comes back, like Tyler Hero is going to have the ball in his hands and take a lot of shots. But depending on the package that comes back, Scoot Henderson could be a guy that puts up. Monster numbers for a rookie next year. Now, yeah. I, don't, I don't think Portland is going to be good, nor do I think uh, that the the Spurs necessarily will be good and be a playoff team, which is why the Chet Holmgren thing is is interesting because I think there's an expectation here that the Oklahoma C- City Thunder are at least in the play-in and probably have a winning record next season. And... Of course, Shea is going to impact that. Both both Jalen Williams are going to impact that. Josh Giddy, of course. But if Chet, you know, if he checks out in in some of these advanced analytics things, and all of a sudden the Thunder are you know forty six and thirty six, he's going to have a real opportunity, uh, barring just a, a, a you know a, a twenty ten and four from Wembenyama or an eighteen nine and five from Scoot Henderson. Like he's going to have an opportunity. He'll be in the thick of things. I think for Rookie of the Year. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and sign up with code JJ. New customers can bet just $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with promo code JJ. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In West Virginia, visit www.1800gambler.net in partnership with Hollywood Casino at Charlestown Races. All games regulated by the West Virginia Lottery. Please play responsibly. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort Kansas, 21 and over in most eligible states, but age varies by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Bonus bets expire seven days after issuance. Eligibility and deposit restrictions apply. Terms at sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms. All right, let's get to our conversation with ESPN's Brian Winhurst. All right, let's welcome in Brian Winhurst from ESPN, my coworker, colleague. I feel like this is a long time coming, Brian. Thanks for coming on The Old Man of the Three. We appreciate it, man. I'm very happy that you had me. And, you know, when you invited me, I thought it was just like um, you're being polite. <laughs> by me <clears throat> so i maybe it was a long time because i was like well he doesn't really mean that he's actually inviting me so thank you <laughs> i actually thought we were going to get this done during the playoffs uh but you know shit happens and uh and here we are uh six days seven days after the start of free agency 
uh, a lot has happened. And, and a little bit has happened as well uh, in pre-agency. Uh, there's some trades uh, around the draft, prior to the draft. Um, is there anything so far that has really surprised you? And I know you, you're a man of intel, so you're, you're hearing things before they get announced. But <laughs> in terms of assigning a draft pick, a trade, uh, is there anything that has surprised you about this period of time, this season in the NBA? I would say one of the surprising moves moves was Jeremy Grant getting five years, $160 million with the Blazers clearly trying to get rid of, get rid of his uh, heart raise, clearly trying to move on from Damian Lillard. I, um, and no offense to Jeremy, great work. He's a two-way player. Those are high demand. Um, I don't understand that decision-making because I think it was pretty clear that the Blazers knew that there was a pretty good chance that Dame was going to ask for a trade. And that move doesn't totally make sense to me. So that move followed by the rest of their inactivity leads, you know, makes me wonder what's going on. The other thing that I was surprised about was the Kings opening up all that cap space and then using it largely to resign their their team um and not like you know really trying to go be aggressive with it to try to upgrade i know they signed the euro league mvp that he'll be a role player um and maybe there was enough maybe there was nothing to do it maybe they investigated big options and and moved on um and i the thing i think was surprising was the celtics moving on from marcus smart um that was a big giant decision uh, they didn't just decide it in the day in that afternoon. They, you know, had obviously talked about it for a while before they pulled the trigger. <clears throat> um, though the, that was something that it didn't knock me over, but it was like, wow, okay, uh, um, they're really changing up their their team. Yeah, I you know, I want to go back to the Kings thing because I, I found that to be interesting. Where it felt like coming off the season that they had just had, uh, getting the three seed in the Western Conference playing the defending champion to seven games, uh, a really solid young core group of guys, and they have cap space, and you assume they're going to add talent with that cap space and ultimately just renegotiated Sabonis, re-signed Harrison Barnes to an extension. Um, and and it, I, we talked about this during the season. You know, One of the interesting things about that team was relative to the rest of the league, they were the most healthy, right? Their their five man starting lineup had the most minutes of any group. They played the most games together, and you look across the Western Conference with the Nuggets, uh, the Suns, uh, Warriors, Lakers, all potentially being a lot better. Uh, I still think the Grizzlies are going to be right up there again in the Western Conference, even without John Morant. Um, you you have to question like, th- are they doubling down on just continued internal development or? Was the market just not there for a big name free agent or a potential big big trade to go to the Kings? Yeah, I think their explanation was they really wanted Chris Murray from Iowa to pair with his brother Keegan. They had the twenty fourth or twenty fifth pick, I think, and something like that. And when Chris Murray went right in front of him, um, and so it was like, well, we didn't, we couldn't have the guy we wanted. So they traded the pick to Dallas and um, for Obax Prosper. And they picked up, you know, they offloaded Rashawn Holmes in the deal. And that that wasn't something that they went into the draft, like, oh, we're going to make a move and get cap space. That it was a draft night maneuver. And they were like, we see an opportunity to give us some flexibility. And they did it. Um, that said, they had flexibility and they, and look, locking down Debonis bonus Sabonis was no minor thing. Like, um, you know, he was one of the guys who was somewhat who was who was benefited from the new CBA. Um, this 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 deal that they made with him wouldn't have been possible a year ago. So, part of it is they were taking advantage of the new CBA and they freed up some space to to do that. So, um, I just thought I was like, wow, there's a team making a move. Like there's because that's what you look for. It's rare that contenders make moves. Boston going with Porzingis, that was a very interesting move. But it's rare that you see contenders, you know, really go for it, really upgrade. The Kings, um, 
we're right is right, right on that edge where I think where one move like that could change everything. Uh, you know, I, I almost look like um, the Nuggets when they went out and got Aaron Gordon. That was like a wow, like that. They're taking a step forward there. And I thought the door was open for the Kings to do it. And maybe this wasn't just wasn't the move there. Maybe it maybe I don't want to assume that I know everything that they did, but that was definitely I thought we were going to hear a lot more about that between the draft and free agency. Like the Kings are going hunting and um and they just didn't. Doesn't mean it was a wrong decision. I was just surprised by it. How did Brian, how did the Lakers get Reeves back at that number? We were talking about this the other day. Well, they signed him to the absolute max they could sign him to. Um, the word max is, is, is tough these days because there's the annual max, there's the max years. And then certain guys, when they get extensions, they can only go so high. And so it's like, you can say that I signed a max contract, but it's really your max. So the most that the Lakers could sign Austin Reeves to was at four years and 56 million in unless because of the CBA, there's always an unless. Um, you may remember years ago the way the Houston Rockets went and sort of pried Jeremy Lin out of New York. Um, this also happened with Tyler Johnson, but the Heat um, matched this. So the way it works is, um, I don't know, should I give the whole etymology? Uh, yes, go, go all the way yeah, back please. to Gilbert Arenas. Okay. Just do please. it. Why not? Okay. Inform okay. the viewers. In 2001, Gilbert Arenas got drafted in the second round by the Golden State Warriors, who sucked. And they signed him to a two-year contract, which is what a lot of second-round picks would get signed to. And he was awesome. He absolutely kicked ass for two years. And he became a restricted free agent. And they could match the offer, any offer. But back then, if you only had two years of service time, you didn't have full bird rights. You only can pay anybody whatever if they're under a three contract if they're under a two-year contract you have what's known as early bird rights so just limited and so the washington wizards had a bunch of cap space i think they paid him 10 or 11 million dollars a year uh the warriors even though he was restricted just functionally could not match it um even you know and send the next year or the year after carlos boozer with the Cavs, same boat he was a restricted free agent the jazz offered him like 12 million dollars a year the Cavs couldn't functionally match it. So they put in a rule that if you were, if you had two years in the league and you were a restricted free agent, you could only get offered up to the average player salary, which it, nowadays is $12 million. So there's a, but there was a loophole in there. It only was for the first two years. And then after the first two years, that restriction gets lifted. So when Jeremy Lin, two years of service time, with the Knicks was an early bird free agent. Here come the Houston Rockets. And they sign him to an offer sheet that was, I don't remember the numbers, but like it was like seven million the first year, maybe eight million the first year, nine million the second year. Okay, that's was the rules. And then in the third year, when the what is known as the arenas provision was lifted, they could go all the way to the max. So the the offer sheet looked like this: seven million, eight million. 21 million, 22 million. And the Knicks were like, wait a minute. You mean if we match this in two years, we're going to uh, have to pay Jeremy Lin $22 million? And so they didn't match. And it made um, it made everybody in New York sick, but it was like a poison pill contract. Um, a few years later, the Nets did it to Tyler Johnson from the Miami heat. He had been really good. One of those non-drafted guys who they like polished up and the nets had like $80 million in cap space. And they're like, well, it wasn't that much, but they had millions and millions of cap space. And like, okay, we're going to, we're going to put him to the test. And, and his contract was like 6 million, 7 million, 18 million, 19 million. Like they backloaded it and the heat actually matched it. And there's a famous story that Tyler Johnson told the ESPN, the magazine after he got the contract, he went into the bathroom and threw up because even though he was getting this money, he like couldn't believe he was getting this type of contract. So fast forward to now, it was possible for a team like the Spurs or um, I don't know, a team like the Thunder, although I could never see them doing this, but a team like the Spurs who had all this cap space and now you have to spend it. Like before you could save your cap space. And as long as you got to the salary floor, 
by the end of the season, you were okay. You could pick up somebody at the trade deadline or whatever. Now you have to have 90% of your salary cap space spent on opening night. Otherwise you face some penalty, which I don't even know what is. So it was possible that somebody could have liked Austin Reeves enough that they could have given this poison pill contract where it was 12 million the first year, 12, five or 13 million the second year. And then it leapt up to literally like 30 million. Um, So that didn't happen. So he didn't get the offer sheet. So the Lakers were able to give him basically a standard four year extension. Um, Who knows? I'm not in the Spurs. I'm trying to think of the other teams. I thought like maybe the magic I'm not in one of those teams front offices to say, Oh yeah, they got real serious, but it was always probable that the Lakers are going to be able to keep him. And um, it was unlikely as good as Austin is. I don't think people in a, in an environment where we are now want to have him on a $30 million contract in, in three years. So it was good for the Lakers that they were able to keep him on that number. But the concept that like Rob Palinka like did some sort of wizardry and sorcery, like, oh my gosh, we talked Austin Reeves into taking a discount. No, they literally paid him every dime they possibly could. They just avoided another team doing something which I would have think would, would regard as stupid. Do you think, I don't know if how Austin Reeves' marketplace fits into this comment I'm about to make, but do you think with the new CBA and the trend of pre-agency for most of the star players, um, that by and large, something like LeBron James in 2010, of course, the anomaly of 2016 with Kevin Durant, but by and large, free agency for the highest level star players is effectively over. I mean, you look last year, I, I would probably say Jalen Brunson was the best free agent and not that Jalen Brunson was, a, wasn't, isn't a star, but you know, g- coming off his Dallas campaign, like he, he wasn't a huge name this year, the two really big names, um, you know, I, I'll say this gently, but have some baggage, right. And, and ultimately James Harden opted in. Kyrie ended up, you know, using some leverage to get back to Dallas, but it just seems like we're headed for a period where teams are just going to extend their best players over and over again, have the contract. We've seen so many times where players like Jalen Brunson get to free agency, the team needs him back and they effectively lose him for nothing. Okay. Let's go to a hundred thousand feet, not only 30,000 feet, a hundred thousand feet. The lockout that we had in 2011, we, as if I was in the union, the lockout that the NBA had in 2011. I had the lock. I was locked you out. Did. I you was were locked, locked out. The F out. That lockout was largely about uh, control of the pie. I would say it's about money, but they're all about money. But um, at that time, the players were making 57%. When, uh, the entire revenue pie the players were making 57%. And the reason they got to 57% was because the NBA installed a luxury tax. Because when the NBA installed a luxury tax, it was like nobody in their right mind is ever going to um, spend to that. Uh, it's going to be a hard cap and you're going to screw us. And they said, okay, well, what if we gave you 57%? It's laughable because now luxury tax is hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in spending in the luxury tax every single year. But anyway... So that lockout was to get that number closer to 50-50, and it worked. The, the owners won that lockout. Um, somewhere, Billy Hunter will be angry. Maybe the players' union will be angry. But when the dust settled, it was 51% for the players, 49% for the owners. They basically closed it down to, all, to almost 50-50. The players can still claim the slight edge, but they collapsed it down. And that 6% difference has been worth billions of dollars and will be worth billions of dollars in the future. Once the owners got that 50% over the last three CBAs, they have slowly but surely peeled back free agency rights. So the super max, um, which, which came in, which was a sort of a, a golden golden is in the right world, diamond encrusted handcuffs um, to put on players. Um, and now like the second apron, which is in existence, which is, which is a, an anti super team building measure with each encroaching. And then, you know, they, you remember JJ, when you came in the league that you could get a seven year contract, then it was a six year contract. Now it's five and four years. Now 
a lot of players are getting one year contracts guaranteed with non guaranteed years in them. We are heading more towards football style contracts. Uh, in fact, I would argue you, what, what year did you sign the one year deal with Phil? 17. It was the year after 16. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. in 17 and I believe 18 as well, the average contract length in free agency was 1.7 years and 1.5 years. Right. So even now we are seeing like, if you look at what the Rockets are doing last year, they signed Kevin Porter to an extension where it was one year guaranteed. And I think three years, non-guaranteed or lightly guaranteed or whatever. Kevin Porter is only guaranteed. I believe this year on his, on his extension. When we see the dust settle on these deals that were also made by the Rockets this year, particularly like Jock Landale, where it came out as a four year, $32 million contract. Hey, maybe he plays all four years and gets all 32 million, but I believe that's one year guaranteed, three years non guaranteed. I know that everybody said that Dylan Brooks is four years full 80 million guarantee, and maybe he will be, but I'm waiting for that one. I'm waiting to see on that one. And so, and like um, Zion's contract, and I know that, that that's related to his injuries, that's basically one year guaranteed. Maybe there's two years guaranteed, but it's mostly non guaranteed. Josh those Hart's are, contract with the Pelicans as well. That was that was one are, year guarantee, team option on the second year, and then a, essentially a mutual option on the third year. Right. These are basically all um, NFL style contracts. And why does the NFL give out contracts like that? Because they have a hard salary cap, and if they they pay a player and the player gets hurt, if they can't get out of the contract, it's, so over the years in the NFL, there's been the the signing bonus and they've used a way to manipulate that to make sure the guarantees go up. But basically the NBA is moving towards the NFL model. Now, if someone from the union heard say that they would absolutely come in here and give a strong rebuttal that I'm wrong. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's that simplistic. The other side of it is that the N- the NBA has gotten more included into the pie of revenue. So that pie of revenue is growing, that 51% is growing, and that by the end of this current CBA, the average player salary might be around $15 million, and that the, the guys who are getting the Supermax are now touching $300 million. So let's not lay awake tonight and be worried about <laughs> the growth of NBA player salaries, but in terms of the structure of the rules and the limiting of free agency and super team building, those measures, that is... After getting that pie closer to 50-50, that is what's been going on. And the reason that's been going on, JJ, as you know, is that the majority of the NBA is made up of small markets. Um, And uh, they have the voting power. And ultimately, as powerful as the Lakers are, as powerful as the Warriors are, just like as powerful as LeBron is, he's got one vote out of 450. The Lakers have one vote out of 30. You know, the the Warriors and Lakers and Knicks and Nets can block vote, but they ain't out voting the Jazz and the and the and the, you know, the the Thunder and the Bucks and the Wolves and the Cavs and all that stuff. So it's been moving in that direction. I think that you're you're spot on and that there there is a trend. It seems like there's more of a trend towards at least that last year of a contract, either being partially or non guaranteed. Um, but that's existed for a while. I, I think the important thing to point out here, Brian, and and you you alluded to this, the players are going to get paid regardless. The players are guaranteed to get the fifty one percent. So in one in one way, shape, or form, that money is going to go into the players' pocket. As whether the that's salary right. cap rises or not, it's going to the players' pockets. How it gets to them and the way contracts are structured. Yeah, there's going to be some changes and there will continue to be these these trends of these non-guaranteed or, or partial guaranteed. Um, you're, uh, I don't know if you were on Get Up the day Tim Bontemps was on there when he said the Lakers did not get materially better over free agency. Uh, we talked last week about this. Um, I thought that they had a great free agency because they didn't do anything stupid. They brought back... <laughs> they, they brought back... They brought back, you know, uh, their guys, Austin Reeves, D'Angelo Russell, Hachimura. They get Gabe Vincent. They get Torian Prince. Um, 
And, and, and I, I, I'm curious to get your perspective on winners and losers in free agency. Cause I think sometimes, uh, it's not just about the big splash. Sometimes it can be about continuity. Bucks is a great example of that. Getting Lopez to come back, him not signing a massive offer sheet with a Houston or someone like that, getting Middleton back. Uh, my team for, I, if you were looking at like straight additions to the team and not just bringing guys back, I, I, I think Houston and, and the Cleveland Cavaliers were my two winners in free agency because of the additions they made to their roster, the new guys coming in. But I'm curious to get your perspective on any winners or losers in free agency or the draft or the trades. Well, there's always shades of nuance in here, which makes it tough to do on non-podcast settings. But I think what Bontemps was reacting to is everybody saw what the Lakers did, and especially on ESPN, it was like, oh my God, Red Auerbach, move aside. (laughs) Pat Riley, move aside. Put Rob Palenka right up there. And like, if you ask me how Rob Palenka has done over the last 11 months, I think he's done excellent. I think it was a mess after the last offseason. I couldn't believe they fielded that team and thought it would win. And I know that they had some a couple of injuries early on. I looked at that team, saw its three-point shooting, saw they were going to start Russ and said, nope, not happening. And then the, the moves that he made at the trade deadline and then this summer have totally turned that team around. They are too deep at every position. They um, they still can't withstand a LeBron James or Anthony Davis like major injury, but like who could withstand their star players going down? Not many. Um, they are much better positioned for the modern NBA and the guys that they got in the trade that they weren't super duper thrilled with, like Malik Beasley, Mo Bamba, they replaced them. You know, like um, I, I don't think that Torian Prince is like a revelation signing, but it's a reasonable replacement for Lonnie Walker, which is essentially who they traded him out for. Like gave Vincent a nice signing. I think he's a mild upgrade on Dennis Schroeder. I don't think they went from, you know, a G league guy to John Stockton, just to be clear. I think it was a mild upgrade. They, they did okay. And the way I judge contracts is as soon as they're signed, can you trade them? Uh, and I've had, uh, I had a, 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 a GM who's been around a very long time who I respect Say, hey, I listened to you say that, and that's not fair. You should judge it in one year. Uh, and that's fine if you want to do it that way. But I always judge, like, as soon as you sign a contract, can you trade that contract if you have to on December 15th? Like, for example, like on Jeremy Grant, I don't think they can. And if Jeremy Grant averages like 33 and 12 in the first two months, he can give me the middle finger and say, and I'll be like, you know what, man, you are correct. Um, so uh, the contracts that the Lakers signed, I don't think any fit into that. I think maybe a hair high on Hachimura because who's given him an offer sheet, but not egregious. Like, I think they were a little bit in trouble with Hachimura because he so overplayed his typical play in the playoffs. And so you don't know as an organization, is it just the way he fit with us or was he just hot for six weeks? Cause he shot, I think 29% on threes for the season. And then he shot 48% in the three playoff rounds. And so you're like, Oh man, well, he's really valuable as, as that player. So Like they may have paid a hair too high for Hachimura. On the other hand, if he's that good, it may end up being a bargain. So it's an acceptable, uh, acceptable deal. And I wasn't sure they were going to handle Russell. I was like, boy, they cannot afford to sign Russell to a contract. They can't trade. They can trade that contract. They could trade that contract on December 15th, I believe. So I think Rob Palenka did a good job. I think Rob Palenka over the last two transaction cycles, which is the trade deadline and this free agency did a great job. I don't think the Lakers blew the blew it out of the uh, water. Um, I look at kind of more smaller moves too. Like I think the San Antonio Spurs, I mean, granted they are under no pressure to improve, but they just got like, for example, yesterday, they just got Reggie Bullock, who's a real player and a 2030 pick swap from the Dallas Mavericks, which might end up not being good. They got him for free. They got him for free. The, the Boston Celtics called up and said, would you like a free player? Yes, we'll take a free player. Thank you. Have a nice day. Um, and they got like Jetty Osmond for free. Now, Jetty Osmond and Reggie Book are not going to change your history, but like they could flip them again. And next thing you know, they've taken some cap space, which they weren't even sure how to use it. And they've turned it into like draft picks and pick swaps and stuff like that. And so I think they did well. Um, I think the the Nuggets have not had the greatest summer. Last summer, 
in the same summer that the Nuggets lost Tim Connolly, they smashed it out of the park. They were in their front office. They drafted Christian Brown, a guy who could play rotation minutes in the finals for them. And if you think that that's easy with the 21st pick, go look at the history of 21st picks in their rookie years. They signed Jeff Green to a minimum contract, extremely great value. They signed Bruce Brown to the taxpayer mid-level, which is like $6 million, maybe the best free agent signing of last summer. Uh, I'd have to go back and really knock it down, but in terms of dollars for production, brilliant. And they traded Morris for Kentavious Caldwell-Pope, wound up playing a very important role in them going to the championship. They played eight players basically on their fi- during the finals, and four of them they acquired last summer. So this summer, they lose Jeff Green. Uh, they, no losing Bruce Brown can't do. They did such a good job with Brown that they lost him. You know, they're not, they can't pay him $20 million. No problem. But then they, because they don't have a backup point guard, they pay Reggie Jackson, who they weren't even playing at the end, $5 million a year instead of paying Jeff Green $5 million a year. And Jeff Green walks on them. So they lose Bruce Brown and Jeff Green and don't really functionally replace them. They did sign Justin Holiday. Maybe he'll be okay, but he's on his 10th team in his career, 10th. So, look, at the end of the day, they have, they have Jokic, and they're probably going to give a good chance to sign Jamal Murray to a contract extension this summer, and they're going to be just fine. But in terms of how their summer operated, last year turned out to be an A, and this year we're not looking so good right now. So, like, I know that, like, if I was pitching this to first take or get up, they'd be like, you want to talk about the Spurs and the Nuggets? Like, they wouldn't have an interest <laughs> in that. But, like, the Spurs have had a good summer, and the Nuggets have not so far, other than, you know, yeah, winning the title. What about uh what about Phoenix outside of the trade? Yeah, so Phoenix, <clears throat> I like when I can see a strategy. And you can see a strategy in the minimum players that they signed. They signed all guys who were long and basically plus three point shooters, like you know, over 35% three point shooters. Now, some of them don't shoot that much. Um like uh, Drew Eubanks doesn't shoot like five a game. He shot like 20 for the season, but he's a guy who can, in theory, stretch the floor a little bit. Um, and all their guys they signed had long arms and had length and that athleticism with the exception of Eric Gordon, who isn't particularly long, but is a killer score and one of the best value minimum contracts. And they did something interesting. Most of the guys they signed to the minimum, they gave a second year player option to. And that seems boring, like it's just something you would read in a tweet and move on with your life. But if you sign a player to a to a um, to a veteran's minimum, it's three million dollars now. How about that, JJ? You could probably go get three million. I guarantee you could get three million dollars this year. I guarantee you could. So just just you think about that. Three million dollars now, but three million dollars for a veteran minimum. I, I I don't want to take a pay cut. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, score. That was spectacular. Oh, brilliant. Well, think of the per diem. What's the per diem? You figure that in? Yeah. Well, I, you, right. you, gotta, you have to factor in the co- the benefits. You know, it's an extra year of uh, my HSA. It's an extra year of a 401k match. I get all that. I get all that. Very, yeah. The health savings account's great for NBA players. All right. <laughs> so anyway, um, $3 million is for the minimum. If you sign a minimum player in the NBA, the NBA actually pays for the majority of that contract. Like out of NBA money. Why? Why do they do that? Because when they did a CBA deal years ago and they were like, wait a minute, the veterans make a million and the rookies make 400 grand. These teams won't sign veterans. They'll sign a bunch of rookies. So they said, okay, here's what we'll do. You pay the same price for every minimum and then we'll pay the rest out of the TV money. So it's like, it's kind of how like the heat paid uh, Udonis Haslam back, you know, like Udonis Haslam, like took pay cuts all those years. And then for like six years, they let him, um, Signed for the veterans minimum, and it was like you know one five one eight two two five. The league was paying for most of it. <laughs> the league was paying his money back. Don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> so, but if you have a two year contract, which a player option could be, it means that you don't get that money. That you know that the uh, the the team pays the whole amount. So that means that I think they signed seven to seven minimums. And I think they gave five of them, four or five of them player options that cost Matt Ishbia something like eight or $9 million in extra salary for this year and potentially next year. And 
corresponding tax. So they have a strategy of what type of players they were going to sign. You're going to sign long guys who can shoot a little bit. And that friend Frank Vogel now is going to go forth and design his defense and strategy, but I'm going to have nine guys that I can play who have long arms and have athleticism and we can stretch the floor and everything like that. And they won battles for some of these guys who had two or three offers like, Hey, listen, we'll give you a player option. So you can walk on us, but, and here's the other thing on a player option. You know, this JJ, if you have a player option on a minimum contract it means you can't be traded without your permission. He, uh, functionally, Eric Gordon has a no trade clause. So if the Suns come to him midseason and say, "Hey, we want to trade you to the to the Charlotte Hornets for so and so," he'd be like, "Nope." So like, if you're trying to weigh like where you're going to go, and you're like, "Well, wait a minute, I can go play in Phoenix for a title in good weather with two percent state income tax." See, you could have gone to Phoenix, JJ, you pay a lot less than you do in New York. And I can block a trade. It's getting better all the time. Good, good golf, too. And I can block a trade. Yeah, I could golf, golf year golf round, Golf in too. January, JJ. I mean, I think they got a roster spot left. How's your? What's your wingspan? Negative. Um, it's negative. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I it was I was, like I don't know if the I, like when you sign minimum contracts, sometimes they're great, sometimes they're not great. They're minimums for a reason. So like these guys could all end up not being good. Like Eric Gordon could be gassed, but. I could see the strategy, what they were doing, and it made sense to me, and I respected it. Brian, I know we're a little crunched on time because you're busy doing TV appearances today. I'm sorry. So I actually want to spend the rest of our time talking about you specifically. Oh, no, no uh, look, I, I, this has been documented. Um, you know, you went to the same high school as LeBron. Uh, you covered him in high school. Um, I, I'm just you. You now have been uh, covering the NBA for 20 years, and I want to just kind of get your perspective on and a little bit of the backstory, just on the evolution of your career from someone who started uh, at working for the, the Akron newspaper to now all of a sudden you're an NBA analyst, an NBA reporter, national reporter, uh, newsbreaker, first take personality, which we'll get to at the very end. But just the evolution of your career and just the perspective that you have on it as it relates to those early years with LeBron. When I first started, I was 25. LeBron was 18, and neither one of us had a clue what was going on. Um, he was obviously super duper talented, um, and, and his talent kind of overruled all. They wouldn't have given me the job at age 25 if they didn't think I had a chance to be successful. I don't want to say that I was, you know, anything like that, but I had some level of ability, which is why I got it at age 25, which back then you didn't get at age 25. You didn't get that type of job until later in your year. Um, so, but I had absolutely no idea what was going on. Like stuff would happen and go zooming over my head. Um, the concept of the travel was brutal. Um, even though I like to travel, you know, like 41 road trips on commercial airlines in the winter, living in the cold weather city, you better make it happen. Um, and, um, with no backup, you know, there was no, like, if you got sick, you just fought through it, you know, basically. So, um, to now 20 years in, I've seen just about everything that you can see in the league. Uh, and so when I see things happen, I can be like, well, you know, back in 05, this happened. I mean, that, that's what used to blow me away about Pat Riley. The the four years I covered the heat and, and the, the, the interactions I would have Riley, which were not many. When I would talk to Riley or listen to Riley talk, there was nothing that happened, literally nothing that happened where Riley couldn't say, well, you know, back in 82 or back in, you know, 76 or, you know, in 2003 or when we won the title in 2006, the guy had experience and knew how to do everything and that had been through everything and had seen it all and had a calmness about everything. He's one of the most impressive people I've ever met in any walk of life. And I say this, I don't think he likes me. We do not have a relationship. I have a relationship with many powerful people in the NBA. There's, you know, many powerful people I can call up and have a great relationship with. He's not one of them. I don't think he likes me. That said, um, overwhelmingly impressed by the Heat organization. 
overwhelmingly impressed by Pat Riley. And one of the things that about him is that he had seen so much. I feel like 20 years in, I see stuff happen now and I go, I know, I know what's going to happen there. Or they bet don't know what's going to happen. Like, okay, I've seen this before. Here's what's going to happen. Or I see somebody doing something and I go, yep, that's a move. And it doesn't always inform like the way, like I never, I don't always say it that way, but like, basically I'm young enough to work 18 hour days for two, three months at a time, which is required ESPN. But I've been around long enough that you can't pull the wool over my eyes. I still get surprised every now and then, but I can still see an organization or a player or a coach say something and go, Nope, I'm not falling for that. And that is where I get, where I feel my experience is I see a team trying to do this. And I'm like, Oh no, 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 no. I'm not letting you get away with that nonsense. Uh, and, um, it's it's I'm really in a wonderful spot right now because I, I I still feel like I'm in like really good handle on the NBA and have experience, but still am excited about it every day, which I know will fade. Right. Like I see people who were at my stage when I took over. I was like, man, that guy knows what's going on, who get to a point with like, yeah, I'm done with it. And I think I'll get to that point where I'll be like, yeah, I'm done with it. Or ESPN or somebody else will be done with me. And they're like, yep, you're done. Um, but I, I think I'm a little ways away from that. And so I feel like I'm in a good spot. Do you have a, do you have a, what if moment, like a thing that you either thought was going to happen or almost happened, or you heard was going to happen that you feel like would have changed the dynamic of the league? Two things, both on just big deals. I mean, there's a bunch of small deals, but, um, by the way, I'm always thinking about that. I'm thinking about it right now with Dame Lillard. Like I was talking with a guy today about a move that I think a team is making. I know I shouldn't tease. I get in trouble when I do this. I'm already getting in trouble now. But like today, I was like, there's a team that's doing something here and I am suspicious. And so I see that still. But in, ter- in terms of like the big the big ones, um, I got tipped off that LeBron was going to go to Miami and I rejected it because I said, no, no, they can't make the cap space and those guys aren't taking less. I just, I pushed it right out. Like I could have had it. I could have really followed up on it like 10 days out. And because I didn't respect that. Yes, they could make the cap space. And yes, those guys would consider taking less. I made an assumption. And that's like my thing. Like don't make assumptions again. I still do because it's human nature, but no, why did I make an assumption and why did I not follow that up? It was an arrogant thing for me to do. And God, did that bother me so much. And look, you know, the thing about it is the level that it would have taken for me to get a confirmation that LeBron was going to go to Miami was probably too high. Because unless I heard it from LeBron himself, it was such a crazy story. How could I ever have said it or reported it? But the fact that I dismissed it because I thought I knew more than I did really bothered me. So now, now when I hear stuff that sounds a little outlandish, I don't close the door on it as fast. I will go down and investigate it a little bit. Uh, the second one was when Kawhi Leonard went to LA. I got told by somebody I trusted that, hey, Kawhi is trying to go to LA with Paul George. And I'm like, Paul George plays for the Thunder. He's got three years left on his contract. What are we talking about here? You know? And I dismissed it and shouldn't have done it. Shouldn't have done it. So those are nine years apart. And I made kind of made the same mistake. Those are two what ifs for sure. Um, I, I, I have a question going back to what you said about Pat Riley. Why, why do you think Pat Riley doesn't like you? Um, I think the heat felt that I was in some way complicit in the believing, even though that's kind of laughable. Um, when he went back to Cleveland. Yeah, because in at the end of the lockout, it became clear to me that LeBron was going to go back to Cleveland. And I and on this case, I did start saying it. Uh, I didn't know when. I didn't even 100% know that it was going to be in 2014. I thought maybe they, he would give it one more year. Um, I just hedged against that. Um but, uh, and they, by the way, the Cavs didn't either. <laughs> the Cavs didn't have the cap space. They, they didn't know. They were, they famously had Gordon Hayward in their building. 
and they were going to sign him to an offer sheet to be their small forward, which would have been matched by you. Gordon Hayward was there. They sent Dan Gilbert's private jet into Indianapolis where he lived to get him. You know, like they didn't think he was coming. Um, but uh, I think that some people in the in the Heat organization thought that I like pushed for it or something. I just saw it. I saw that it was going to happen. And I didn't talk about it every day, but I did talk about it. And um, I don't know, it kind of left a scar. And like, I I get it. I get it. Like, um, if LeBron had left, had just stayed in, in Miami and just going there, the Heat would have continued to have bites at the apple. And he's won two titles and he won, he might have won two more titles in Miami. And it may have been a glorious run. And Pat Riley could not compute why he wouldn't stay there for that. So I kind of get it. But I also could just tell that he wanted to go home too. But I have a great relationship with the Heat organization now. I have immense respect for them. But I do think when it went down that there was some bad feelings there. What's the biggest difference from the beginning of your career to now in 2023 in terms of how the league is covered, how you see fans, players, teams consuming content, contributing to content, whatever it may be. Like, what, do you, what do you think the biggest difference is in the, in, in the last 20 years? The fans are five times as sophisticated in how they view the league. They understand generally the cap, um, they may not know the finer points, but they understand you can't trade a minimum player for a guy making 30 million. They understand uh, contracts. They understand basic salary cap. Um, the NBA fan has become way more of an educated uh, consumer than they were back then. In terms of the reporting, everything is so fast and it goes out to the media before it goes to players. Sometimes, I mean, a lot of times it happens so fast. There is such a demand for the, um, for the, for it to get the information out. And not only that, because of that, um, that it's, it's commodified. And the other thing is, is that now stories are covered in sections. Um, player asks for trade, trade negotiations, offers, like, a transaction is covered in, in three, four, five different layers. We're seeing that and now we with saw- Damian Lillard. We're seeing that right now with Damian Lillard. Yes, There's been an evolution. Yes, um, I, I, it started right around the draft, right? I mean, he came out and said the, the Miami-Brooklyn thing. Uh, there was a lot of speculation about what Portland would do with the number three pick. I said on draft night when they drafted Scoot Henderson, there was no deal. I said if Scoot Henderson is there next year, to me, whether it's next week or six months from now, that's that to me is the – like. That's the biggest indicator to me that Dame's going to be eventually on a different team, right? That they didn't use that pick. Because that was, I think, the plan all along was to try and use that pick to get a all-star level player in return. As an aside, the Blazers have been in a rebuild for two years. They just didn't tell anybody. You know that new phenomenon, quiet quitting? They were quietly rebuilding. And they tanked last year. Now, last year, Dame got hurt, so it made more sense. But they tanked last year. They gave Dame the extension, which they didn't have to do. But they gave it to him without a no-trade clause. So there was an inherent wink-wink. Even if Dame didn't see it that way, they were basically locking him in to make him a more of an asset. Because if he had played one more year and he only had one year left on his contract, he would have had vastly more control. Then they went into this last season, and at the deadline, they traded away Josh Hart. Now, I'm not saying that Josh Hart is the difference between being the 11 seed and being the 6 seed, but that is a high quality, is a quality player that they gave away for a draft pick. That is a rebuilding team move. And then they tanked again at the end of this last season, and it worked. By the way, they ended up moving up in the draft. They drafted two majors in back-to-back years. So all of those moves are not the moves of a team competing. So they're saying on one side, oh, we're, we're going to bring in guys. And on the other side, they're not actually doing that. Now, maybe if Joe Quinn was here on this podcast, he would say, here's the list of 11 trades that I proposed that would have brought in a 
happen and didn't work. And I can't, so I could only look at his work, but his work is of somebody who is rebuilding the roster. And so um, the particularly the thing about having Dame sit this season to ensure the tank. There's no other way to look at that. That's a naked rebuild move. And the reason they can, I don't, I shouldn't say I know for sure, but my speculation, the reason they got him to do it is because they said, we're going to get a better draft pick who we're going to get for a veteran. And then they didn't after they said they would. And look, I give, I've said that I give a pass on this because when they were, it's one thing to say, you're going to trade the number five or six pick in this draft. And it's another thing to say, you're going to trade the number three pick. Those two, those two positions were materially different in this draft, but don't come out and say one thing and do another. So in my view, Dame has every right to ask for a trade because there has been a disconnect in what they've said they're going to do, and what they've done. Now, whether or not he has the ability to control where he gets traded, that's a different topic. Um, but he didn't get a no trade clause for a reason. But you are correct, JJ. There is what we, I, we in the business call incremental reporting. You move the ball one to three yards up the field for one month, three months, six months on a transaction that didn't, it did and obviously when like Shaq would get traded from the Lakers, it was kind of like that. But generally when I started, you didn't have as much incremental reporting because you had one news cycle per day. You would wake morning, you would read all of the information for the day for the newspapers that published once a day, you would close the window and say, see you tomorrow. And that's not true. It's 24 hour news cycle. And so you see this incremental reporting and each of those incremental reports all have their own set of circumstances attached to them. So that is what is majorly different, you know, and on the news game from, from, the, from then to now. Do you think, you think some of that is, I mean, this is kind of obvious, but it's just a social media, you know, driven phenomenon. I, I've seen this with, you know, I've been like, I've been at games. I've been, I've been when players with players from different teams where there's been photos taken of them. And then all of a sudden it becomes like, Oh, he's recruiting. So-and-so he's doing this, he's doing that. In reality, it's like, they're just friends. You know, and so there's a thing where it's like there's a sometimes there is just the, the narrative of things being of things happening because of Twitter or Instagram or or things that really are not based in any fact. Well, I think there's the difference between being friendly and being friends. You know, it's one thing to be friendly with somebody, take a photo with them. It's another thing to like plot. We're going to, you know, we're going to align our contracts and play with each other. Yeah. The one reliable source on this in Team USA. Team USA has regularly created bonds that have led to things. It's happening right now. Lillard befriended or, or at least deepened his relationship with Bam Adebayo in the month they were together, or five weeks or whatever it was in Japan in 2021. And in that particular case, during COVID, nobody was allowed to leave the hotel. Those guys were literally, all they could do is be with each other. And there's a relationship that he's got with Tatum. That you know was an outgrowth of that. Uh, you go back and look at all these transactions. So many of them happen with Team USA. They just announced, they're announcing today the Team USA for this World Cup, and they're mostly young guys, okay? And I don't know what it's going to be, but, like, I promise you, there's going to be guys who play with each other for the six weeks this summer, love their, their personality, love the games go together, and they're going to, I'm not saying that they're going to leave the plane uh, when they get home and go, okay. 2027, me and you, but like, it's going to be in their heads. Hey man, I'd love to play with someday. Team USA is the real recruitment zone. Although, I mean, it really turned up with LeBron, Bosch and Wade. That's where it happened. It didn't happen when they were at the McDonald's all American games or whatever. It happened with team USA. And um, to me, that's the ground where you take notes. And I, and I covered the Olympics in 2021, but we were so kept at such a distance we were able to talk with the players face to face which was great but we weren't able to um to really be around the team because of covid so i didn't really come out of that with as much understanding as i in previous times at team usa about guys who were close with each other i think in respect to tommy's the first part of tommy's question i, I think you hit hit it on the head a little bit earlier when you said everything has been commodified um, and so information has been commodified and then that information goes out on social media or on get up or first take or whatever other sports channel. And that, uh, leads to engagement 
uh, which then leads to clicks and leads to views and all that. And, you know, the, 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 the information thing, I think is a, is a big part of the way the league operates now. And because there are the platforms on social media that require engagement, I think that's a big, a big part of it. Speaking of social media, another great thing about social media is memes. And I know you've been asked a lot <laughs> about the yeah. Brian Winhurst meme, which was an all time first take appearance. If anybody hasn't read, there's an oral history that came out a few days ago on GQ.com. It's actually very entertaining. There's some absolutely great quotes and bars in there from different uh, characters in this story. Um, in respect to the meme and that appearance on First Take, did you have a favorite meme, a favorite thing that came out of that? You know, I really didn't follow the memes that closely because it's such a heavy work time. Uh, but it was the non-basketball stuff. So like, um, I remember one that was like, it's July 5th and there's still, uh, <laughs> there's still fireworks blowing, exploding all over my neighborhood. Now, why is that? <laughs> you know, but you know, what I loved about that GQ story is I don't know Royce O'Neal. I really never had a chance to talk to him and I just didn't happen to see him this last season of all the teams and players I saw, I never saw him. And so I never like ever got to talk to him about, it. I did get to talk to other players who were involved about it, like uh, Gobert and some other uh, Donovan Mitchell, obviously like when I went and did a sit down interview with Donovan Mitchell at the start of the season, Donovan wanted to pose with me in with the pose. He's like, he's like, Hey, he w like, that wasn't my phone. That was his phone. He wanted the photo. Okay. And then listening to Royce talk about it, like, like it was a real positive experience for him, even though he was traded and he was traded, you know, from a, uh, you know, huge, huge change in his career in life that he was getting in Brooklyn. I don't know how his reaction would be um, because I was almost kind of like, I wasn't dismissing him, but I was kind of like, what, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so I liked that he had positive memories of it. And Donovan had positive memories. Uh, so sure Rudy had positive <laughs> memories of it. Um, you know, Donovan had like sweatshirts made up with it. Like, you know, for like personal use. Like, so I'm glad there's so much happens in the media that is upsetting to players. And like, that's another thing that I've learned over 20 years is just how much we make players and teams we headaches and sometimes our job and it's like, look, this head you're having is part of your job, but sometimes it strays where we either intend or unintentionally cause players or teams heartache or discomfort or frustration or unintended consequence or sometimes intended consequence cause issues. So I was happy that this actually positively affected some people and that the t in that Utah, the fans in Utah are actually have a positive vibe about because they're kind of happy with where their team is. Uh, but there's good feelings to come out of it because there's other stuff that you do or report on. Like I said, like saying that I thought LeBron was going to leave Miami, that was also accurate. Although I wasn't as firm about that and it wasn't as instantaneous, that caused a lot of trouble. And I'll, even though it was wonderful for Cleveland, it caused a lot of trouble in Miami and upset a lot of people and i faced a fallout from that i don't regret it and i was i was right but uh so it feels good that there was a positive i do get a little worried though jj i didn't intend i mean i i knew what i was talking about and what i thought was going to happen did happen and i was just trying to avoid saying exactly what i thought was going to happen in case it didn't happen because then it would be used as be weaponized against me um but i while that was happening was blowing up I'm very aware that something negative could happen just as powerful of something I didn't intend. And so I, because I'm a pessimist, as that was raging, I was like, well, I'm worried about the negative karma that's building up that someday I'll do something that will be viewed at as negative and will snowball that way. So I'm just hoping to stay the course and st stay warm, never be too hot, never be too cold. Yeah, I was gonna I was gonna ask about just information in general. And I, I don't think I've ever asked Woj this either, you know, privately, but the ability to sit on information and not make it be public, where you can be like the guy who got it right, is that a difficult thing? 
Well, that's you, you working and li- living in the league, you knew information all the time. Oh, yeah. But I guess it's not your job, you know, but. Well, yeah, I mean, I can specifically remember a, a very big trade that no one knew about. And I had the info for like a week. And every day I'm like refreshing Twitter, like this is going down, this is going down. And it finally went down. But like, I, I, didn't, I guess it was because it wasn't my job. I didn't feel the need to like tell anyone. Right. I literally told no one. <laughs> <laughs> right, right but also i didn't want to fuck the people who told me <laughs> and, and that though that's the thing like you're just you don't want to be wrong ultimately there isn't maybe there is somebody who does this but there's not a scoreboard out there where people are like, like checking what you got right and checking what you got wrong you either know what you're talking about or you don't you either have a, a pulse on the league or you don't and i'd like to think that i do have a pulse on the league i don't know everything that's going on most of the trades that happen, I am aware that they are they are going to happen, or or something. I may I may not know exactly who's being traded for whom, or exactly who's going to sign. But most of the transactions that happen, sixty ish, seventy percent, I am at least aware that they are going to happen, or possibility of them happening. But there's some that blow me out of the water, and there's some percent. Like for example, I was pretty sure that Max Struess was going to be an Indiana Pacer a week ago. There's a lot of talk in that direction. And it was strong enough where I could have come on TV and said, yeah, I think Max Drews has got a true chance to be a pacer. But then things changed. The bidding war for Bruce Brown got, got higher. They offered more. The Cavs were able to figure out a sign and trade than a pacer. You know, like I could have been wrong about that, but I, I, I wasn't sure. So I didn't say it. And look, there have been times where I thought something was going to happen. I said it and it didn't happen. You know, so um, mostly you're just trying to 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 you you only have your reputation to stand on, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to say I'm going to give you the information I can give you, and hopefully people either say you know what you're talking about or you don't, and that you prove that you can do it. Um, I would love to be able to say what everything that I know, but it's completely not responsible, and so I can't. And I and I get myself in trouble sometimes. Uh, a alluding to information, but I just kind of want to indicate that, you know, I just want to, I kind of want to dance around it and just sometimes try to entertain because sometimes we do try to want to make good television and good podcasts. That's part of what we do. Um, Well, I just want to, I want to say this before, I want to say this, Brian, before we let you go, Uh, my favorite part of the first take appearance from last summer, having been, with you on air is I know when you are talking, you ask a question while you're talking and making a point. My favorite part of that appearance was your co-panelist as you're going on your, you know, whatever it was, you know, 139 seconds of talking, <laughs> you're asking questions and they're answering them like right away. They're just answering them. You're like, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I do like that too. But they're trying to get, they're trying to uh, Kevin Durant. I was like, no. No, just let me cook. No, no, let me cook. (laughs) Um, All right, Brian, we appreciate the time, man. Thank you so much. Thank you, JJ. (laughs) 